Welcome back. This is our 21st class session and our third online class meeting. We've just finished our overview of conspiracy and we turn now to another important aspect of the so-called general part of the criminal law, the affirmative defenses. Up to this point, we have focused on the prosecution's case in chief and defenses that consist in raising a reasonable doubt about or negating some element of that case. This might mean showing that the actus reus has not been proven. For example, an alibi defense, that it wasn't the defendant who committed the crime or that no crime happened at all. Or the prosecution's case might be met with a mens rea defense, the required culpability is not established, as, for example, the defense of mistake or ignorance as to some material element. The affirmative defenses are of a different nature. They do not themselves contest the prosecution's case in chief. Instead, they introduce additional facts that put the conduct alleged into a wider context. An affirmative defense might take the form of showing that even if the defendant did what the prosecution alleges, it was not wrong of the defendant to do it. This, in outline, is what is termed a justification defense. Another kind of affirmative defense relies on evidence that even if the defendant did wrong, the defendant should not be blamed. This, in outline, is what is termed a defense of excuse. We are about to take a look at these. We begin with the most familiar of the justification defenses, the defense of self-defense. Self-defense is typically raised in cases in which the defendant is charged with homicide or another crime of violence. Typically, the defendant does not contest the prosecution's case in chief. But it is conceivable that a defendant might deny having been the perpetrator, it wasn't me, it was someone else, and also raise the defense of self-defense. Whoever did it was acting in self-defense. We will focus on the typical cases in which the defendant does not contest the prosecution's case in chief. People versus Getz is one of these typical cases. Although in many ways, Getz is a far from ordinary case. Getz started firing a pistol in a crowded New York subway car, striking four people. One of Getz's victims was paralyzed for life. The other three were less gravely injured. There was no dispute that Getz was the shooter, and Getz confessed on videotape that his purpose in firing the gun was to kill his victims to murder them, in his words. He was charged with four counts of attempted murder, as well as lesser charges. From the moment of the shooting until the present day, the Getz case has been sensational. Why did he do it? Getz insisted that he felt threatened by the four young black men he shot. One of them had asked him for $5. Getz said he believed he was about to be mugged. But Getz did not give that explanation immediately. He ran and surrendered to police in another state. Getz was extradited to New York. Along the way, he offered a non-apology. I'm sorry, but it had to be done. Yes, somebody had to shoot these four black youths for making Getz fearful of being mugged. And who better to do it than Getz himself? Getz had been mugged before. That had led him to buy a gun. Getz admitted that he believed that his victims were unarmed. Troy Canty, Daryl K.B., James Ramsour, and Barry Allen. None of them made any threatening gesture or verbal threat. Police found that the victims were in possession of screwdrivers unregistered screwdrivers. But there is no legal requirement to register a screwdriver in New York City or to be licensed to carry a concealed screwdriver. 
firearms are treated differently. Getz not only illegally possessed a firearm, he drew it and aimed it. He aimed it and fired it, not into the ceiling or the floor. He fired it at other human beings. He shot Daryl Cavey twice, saying, You seem to be all right. Here's another. The last bullet severed Cavey's spinal cord and left him permanently paralyzed. I'm sorry, but it had to be done. It was necessary. Necessary for what? To prevent Daryl Cavey from using a screwdriver to break into video games? To prevent a mugging? Who, other than Getz, would have thought that Troy Canty, by smiling as he asked for $5, was threatening Getz with bodily harm? Who, other than Getz, would have thought that the only way for Getz to avoid being maimed and to hang on to his $5 was to shoot four passengers on a crowded subway car. We might feel sorry for Getz, but how could his pathetic thoughts justify what was otherwise unquestionably attempted murder? The law of self-defense is a law of necessity, as Blackstone put it, in his Commentaries on the Laws of England which during the 19th century was the only law book consulted by most American lawyers. The Peterson Court elaborates by adding, the right of self-defense arises only when the necessity begins and equally ends with the necessity, and never must the necessity be greater than when the force employed defensively is deadly. To be entitled to an acquittal must the jury agree that Troy Canty was mugging Bernard Getz and that to get Canty to stop it was necessary to shoot Daryl Cabey, not once, but twice? Blackstone adds, The necessity must bear all the semblance of reality and appear to admit of no alternative. The words semblance and appear are especially significant for a defendant like Getz. A jury might conclude that there was no need to use violence because there was in reality no threat or because there was an alternative way to avoid a threat. A jury might agree that there was no necessity and still acquit the defense, defendant on grounds of self-defense. Of course, some defendants face real threats that leave no alternative to violence. Others, like Getz, may still defend by persuading the fact finder that there was all the semblance of necessity and that there was no alternative that was apparent to the defendant. In this way, the defense of self-defense shades between justification and excuse. This idea is reflected in the wording of the New York statute at issue in Getz. A person may use physical force upon another person when and to the extent he reasonably believes such to be necessary to defend himself or a third person from what he reasonably believes to be the use or eminent use of unlawful force by such other person. Notice the words repeated, reasonably believes. The defendant, in other words, may have been mistaken in two ways. The, the victim might not in reality have been an immediate threat, or two, the threat, though real, might have been avoidable without the use of force. The defendant will still have a defense of self-defense if the fact finder is persuaded that the defendant reasonably believed there was an imminent threat and reasonably believed there was no other way to avoid it. The issue before the highest appellate court in New York, in the Getz case, was the instruction given by the prosecutor to the grand jury to secure Getz's indictment. New York and Georgia are among only four states that still use grand juries. The charge given to the grand jury asked it whether the defendant's conduct was that of a reasonable man in the defendant's situation. 
This was not helpful to Goetz, who was hardly the model of the reasonable man. Goetz's counsel had the indictment set aside by an intermediate court, which approved the defense's preferred instruction, which would have had the grand jury focus on whether the defendant's conduct was reasonable to him. The prosecution then appealed to the highest court in New York, which reinstated the indictment, holding that the word reasonable is intended to set an objective standard. The question is not what did Getz think reasonable, but what a reasonable person in Getz's situation would have thought. Would a reasonable person think Canty posed an imminent deadly threat? And would a reasonable th person think the only way of stopping that threat was to use deadly force? Not just once, but five times. Ultimately, a jury convict acquitted Getz of the charge of attempted murder. Juries will be juries. It is a shame we can't discuss this case together as a class. If you have a chance this summer, you might add George Fletcher's book, A Crime of Self-Defense, to your reading list. Fletcher is the Cardozo Professor of Jurisprudence at Columbia Law School in New York City. His book is not only a fascinating account of the backstory behind what we read in our casebook, it is also a lucid essay on a wide range of criminal law doctrines and the theories behind them.